everyone and welcome to the Caucasus Talks podcast series. Today we have Ejem with us. And before starting our conversation, I will just present her briefly. Ejem Sarajair currently pursues her PhD degree in the history of architecture and urban development at Cornell University. Her dissertation analyzes the history of art, architecture, urbanism in the South Caucasus, with particular focus on the displacement and resettlement of people in the region, as well as the alternative solidarities existing among them. To do so, she investigates the imperial and colonial projects by the British, Ottoman and Russian empires, and later the various nation building projects of past and present countries in the South Caucasus, such as Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan and the Soviet Union. Previous to her PhD research at Cornell, Ejem received a master's degree in design from Kadir Has University and the bachelor's degree in architecture from Istanbul Technical University. She was also a practicing architect on various projects including artist and scholar Inji Eviner's contribution to the 13th Istanbul Biennale. She was awarded the Haram Drink Travel Grant and the Salt Research Fund, as well as various fellowships such as the Cornell Institute of Comparative Modernities Reading Group Fellowship and the Andrew Mellon Urbanism Fellowship. Currently, she is a Canadian Center of Architecture Doctoral Research, Research Residency Fellow. She lives and teaches in Ithaca, New York, and before the pandemic, she divided her time between Ithaca, Istanbul, and Amsterdam. Welcome, Ejem. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to you for accepting our invitation, and I hope we are going to have a nice conversation and on your research, which is really, really interesting for me personally and for Caucasus Talks. And I guess we will just go to our first question. Sure. Yeah. So the first question that I would like to ask you is how did you get interested in architecture and this connection to identity and politics, specifically in the South Caucasus region? So um, maybe I should go back to my master's thesis because my interest in the South Caucasus architecture is actually kindled then. Um, when I was writing my master's thesis, which was focusing on the artistic practices on the border spaces, I was awarded granting travel grant to, to conduct a field work in Turkey-Armenia border for a case study for the master's thesis. And with that grant, I actually had the chance to visit Kars and Gumri, Kars where my family, uh, both sides of my family are from. And during that visit, I actually um, started to realize this idea of migration, which I previously never thought about. Um, because migratory background is so common to people in cars, and I uh, realized that the migration is a common story for many families around the region. And I started to get interested in how uh, migration and architecture were related to each other. So um, when like being interested in a place like the South Caucasus, where archives are at best scattered, hard to find, and when you find um, it is generally written from the written and kept from the perspective of military and state, it's very hard to get into its inhabitants' perspectives. And um, I, I thought in my work that architecture provides that kind of an evidence to start talking about and start discussing the region's history from the perspectives of, of its inhabitants. So I asked the question, in my dissertation, I asked the question, how do the displacement and resettlements of peoples in the South Caucasus shape its architecture and more widely its, its built environment? And, and these movements that I'm talking about, and we know that there are many reasons and very different kind of movements that is happening in the South Caucasus. Um, and like there are many different reasons for it. There is forceful migration that, and, and displacement projects that both em empires and the nation states undertook and still undertaking in the region. And there is genocide. And how all these movements were related to architecture was my first way into thinking about um, architecture um, in South Caucasus. And I realized that these movements are actually heightened in the periods of transitions. Um, and I started to define for me, uh, for this work, various uh, moments of transition in the Caucasus, in the South Caucasus region, taking into account um, wider political changes that are happening 
And the first one is, of course, the dissolution of the empires. In this case, both the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire is one of the first transition periods I'm looking at. Um, a second one is when the emergence of First Nation states around 1917. Um, a third one is around 1930s, where there were ideas of alliance, uh, federation in the region. And of course, then the thesis moves into a little further in the history to 1993, where um, violence and just uh, conflict um, erupt once more in, in the form of um, war and people started, people are being very displaced once more in, in huge numbers. So like both the ongoing scholarly interest I had, but also my family history was actually my way of getting into architecture um, and the region's history in general through the idea of migration. Thanks, thank you. So you mentioned the connection between architecture and the formative period of nation building, especially after the collapse of uh, the empire. So my second question probably would be, why do you think that architecture or like, do you think that architecture plays such a key role in identity construction and also nation building in the modern era? And so why this is happening? And did it have the same effect on the people in the pre-modern era? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we look at the different parts of the South Caucasus, we see that they, different kind of states, both empires and the nation states, um, are using architecture um, as a means to construct identity or strengthen identities that existed in the region. But there is, it is at such a place that there are so many forms of um, community kinships and ethnic alliances and ideas of nations that um, architecture becomes a very interesting um, tool to try to work out these. And, but not only state, I would say, used architecture as a tool to um, construct identities. I would say also the peoples who inhabit the region, many different ethnic um, and religious communities that inhabit the region have used architecture and space in general as means of resistance to these forms that were being, um, um, being processed and put top bottom for them and also they are alternative forms of identities through they, their ways of engaging with the architecture and i think these processes are um, much more visible for me especially in the border spaces of the south caucasus places like in my dissertation i'm looking at cars that is today in turkey gumri in armenia batumi in georgia and now Akhtivan in azerbaijan and in these border spaces, we see that how the political powers use of architecture um, as a means to construct identities is also being repurposed by the inhabitants who are living in these regions as an, an alternative to and against these um, top bottom forms of identity. Um, but the second part of the question, the pre-modern architecture and its relationship to identity is also very a very fruitful discussion for the South Caucasus because the pre-modern architecture never loses its um, importance for this place, for the state of the South Caucasus, for the peoples who inhabit the South Caucasus. Um, and I think to pick up from my work, it could be interesting to talk about Ani. Um, it's a great example to talk about this. Um, so in Ali, we see that in different times of the history, both pre-modern and modern era, um, the, the, its built environment has been used for constructing and strengthening identities. For example, in like 12th century, um, after the con conquest of Ali, uh, we see that there are new buildings that are being added or repurposed for the new inhabitants and a new power. But also at the end of 19th century, when um, after the Russian Empire um, took the territory of Kars and the surrounding region, it became a place where um, many different communities um, were engaged in Ani for political awareness, for national awareness, for um, finding meanings of their uh, communities and history. 
But I mean, like brings together this pre-modern and modern in in even a um, in much longer trajectory because I mean today is still a very important site for identity uh, yeah. um, for the people living in the region. Yeah, and I guess not only for the people living there, but also for those I will speak especially from the side of Armenians. Like you know, it's one of the symbols which is always spoken about. So it's really interesting that you are touching upon also this city. Uh, maybe I will move to the third question, which is somehow also linked to what we are speaking. And maybe like, you know, Ani can be in one example, and then we can add the other cities that you are speaking about to kind of have an overall view on uh, what we are uh, like, you know, specifically discussing here. And the question will be, how does architecture attest to the intertwined history of not only the area covering nation states of Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia, but also northeastern Turkey, like specifically Kars? So the point is that like right now we have always this debate when we are speaking about South Caucasus and we're always forgetting that Turkey is part of also like the shared history and the shared culture. You cannot separate the Turkish architecture be it pre-modern, be it modern period from this region, or like, you know, the same can be applied also to Iran. So I want to see kind of what is your perspective on this intertwined history and how we should deal with it, or like, you know, how you are dealing with it as a scholar of architecture. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a great question. Indeed, there is this debate in the literature when it's South Caucasus. It, um, sometimes is being limited to Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. And um, in some cases, it makes so much sense because they also have a shared history of being Soviet Union, um, etc. But as you said, how I see, especially thinking from the perspective of intertwined histories, um, I try to see more than just the um, more clearly defined nations of these nation states, but there are so many different communities and peoples who inhabit this region and their history inter like the, the intertwinedness of their history actually is more visible when we start looking at the South Caucasus borders, which prominently includes cars. It's kind of hard to talk about the borders of the South Caucasus and even the establishment of these nation states without considering the processes at the end of 19th century that were happening in cars. And, um, so just to give an example, Kars today is seemingly very homogenous, is inhabited predominantly by Muslims. Um, the biggest two groups ethnically, probably Turkish people and Kurdish peoples. But there are many more um, other ethnic and um, religious communities that are actually living in Kars. But like in a contrast, at the end of the 19th century, Kars was a very cosmopolitan region where Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire, Transcaucasian Republic, Southwest Caucasian Republic, the first Armenian Republic, Soviet Union, and Turkey had consecutively um, territorial claims. And also around these years from 1980s on 1950s actually onwards, we see that in Kars um, lives Estonian and Latvian people, Swiss, mm. Swiss cheesemakers, Western European engineers, Russian Orthodox sectarians, and also many different peoples from the North Caucasus, like Lesgians, Karapapaks, Ossetians, and of course, um, quote-unquote Tatar Muslims, or what is Azerbaijani people today, um, Armenians, Kurds, and Georgians, um, being the most majority uh, living in the country. So thinking from that, that history, it's kind of hard to leave cars outside um, and to be able to understand how histories of these people intertwine. Um, I find it that is necessary to bring, bring together these different border spaces because we cannot understand the processes that was happening in one, like in Gumri, without talking about cars. Um, without talking about cars, it's hard to talk about Batumi. And once you start to look at the histories of these places, you see how these um, border spaces, because of the people um, that inhabit these places and their move movements, but also because of the states, um, is incredibly connected. Um, but of course, this intertwined history is not devoid of violence and conflict and 
fighting, like constant fighting among people. And maybe like it's a good uh, point to talk about the violence because when you look at the architecture, of course, we do see um, demolishment of many places in the built environment, right? Or like violence repurposing of um, important sites for one community um, turned into museums, schools, or like even more violently into stables, right? Um, and this this is part of all the history, the intertwined history of these people inhabiting the place. Now, maybe as a conclusion, what I can say is that um, this this condition of so many different communities, ethnic and religious and otherwise, coming together and living and trying to live in this place, in cars uh, specifically, could be extended to other South Caucasus borders. And that's why I am interested in looking during Batumi and Nakhchivan as well as cars to understand its uh, region's history. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting answer. And like it gave me so many things to think about that I was like, as a historian, you know, we're always like moving from the different side and then like hearing these perspectives on like, you know, how you actually do the history of buildings. But maybe to specify a little bit and also like for my own interest, I wanted to ask another sub question to this, which is about the types of the buildings. So we are speaking about cars, about Gimri, but we always know that the national or ethnic memory when it comes to these uh, cities, especially, it's always towards the religious buildings. So maybe also to specify for our listeners, to for our listeners of the podcast, I wanted to see when you are speaking and when you are analyzing the cities, what specifically you are focusing on, and like you know, does this is this a continuation of the same like religious building history, or you are looking also on the urban aspect of it and how? the coexistence or like, you know, the violences that you are mentioning about. Is this necessarily only about religious architecture or does this include also some other buildings? Yeah, thank you so much for asking that question. I think that helps me clarify um, a point too. So um, I try to say built environment at most times because I'm actually kind of extending, uh, taking architecture as a more um, in its wider sense, that how it governs a most built environment, sometimes an unbuilt environment gets into, as you're like referring to. Um, so in this region and specifically in these places, I'm looking at urban development as well, as much as we can call it urban development at the 19th century, which includes their um, street plans to their plannings of gardens. and. Even the type of um, rural planning that was happening for um, fields and rural settlements that would not be considered um, maybe that directly as part of heritage. You know, I'm looking at the many different architecture that existed in this um, rural settlements, such as from mills to um, more, uh, more or less, uh, less clearly defined spaces that are architecture, but is, like prominently part of the built environment for the people who inhabited there. Um, there are a lot of um, stories and some partially written documents about how the fields themselves were um, a topic of both discussion and sometimes collaboration among the people. So those kind of um, spatial um, elements get into the thesis. So I'm trying, I'm a little go, I'm a little bit going out of just focusing on architecture, <clears throat> although it is very important for the people and uh, for the region, and it is, it still is very important for the memory and for the trauma too. So um, the churches in the region, especially let's um, give the example of cars, um, as a very important, it was one of the very important architectural speed, like elements that I am, of course, looking into. Um, but I try to um, extend the, the view to other kinds of um, spatial organizations and um, places that people inhabited and repurposed and um, occupied. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying this point. So. Maybe now we shall move from the past to present and future because like everything we discussed is about like the historiography, the stories and the cities that we are talking about. But 
Another point that is actually also crucial for us as a media is what to do next and how to do it. And my next questions are going to go towards this direction. So uh, as you also are a practicing architect and like from your biography, we learned that you have been in the analyst. The next question will be uh, how and should the scholars and activists in the South Caucasus and Turkey be involved together in the preservation and or restoration of architecture and how and why this is important? So the outright answer is yes, of course, um, but I, maybe I should just pick up from the violence um, that I was talking about in, in the answer to the previous question. Um, what I believe is that to one way start getting out of this trauma is actually working up, uh, working on these sites together. Um, but it's not only um, for that, but also the possibility of doing new and critical work lies in the um, potential of collaboration um, in the South Caucasus. And um, also for working in solidarity, um, different um, scholars, artists, and um, academics who are interested in the region um, ideally should work together on the on the regions because we we do need initiatives that will go um, against and beyond um, national state limitations that we have right now for working on these places. Um, let me give you an example, um, and this is a place like um, this. I've started thinking more um, concretely in my last fieldwork. I was um, lucky enough to travel to Turkey and, and visit Kars during the spring semester. And um, so there is this neighborhood called Kaleichi um, neighborhood, which is the one of the oldest neighborhoods that is being um, inhabited by people. Um, in cars and right now it is one of the poorest neighborhoods in cars as well and I and, and I heard that there is a Toki development project to um, just demolish and reconstruct residential housing in this area for those of uh, us who doesn't know Toki is a state like it is an official state sponsored organization for construction development throughout Turkey and they are building one after the other, this very um, standardized housing projects, um, generally high rise housing projects. And they actually have also already um, 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 rebuilt some parts of cars. So they've already had like two projects that were about to finish. What is scary is that if, um, like there is of course, an urgent situation with such a neighborhood in cars where when you talk to the residents um you see that they like they agree how beautiful the spaces are they are proud of their living spaces and these are um one maximum two-story um housing units that are in terrace is like perfectly fitting the landscape of the like the castle and the mountain hill that it, the castle is situated in um, but at the same time, this place has been um, accepted as a heritage site, so they're not allowed to do any um, work on their um, living spaces. What could be, of course, mitigated is that the state of perhaps these people to renovate and um, find more peaceful ways to um, both keep the neighborhood and then make their living spaces better. But as I said, this is one of the poorest neighborhoods in Kars still. Um, and when you walk around the neighborhood, what you see is that the, the heritage is not only these buildings, but there are so many historical remnants. Just let, Some of them are just lying on the surface of the soil. There are gravestones. There are half-buried churches. And these are just like part of the neighborhood right now, but when a Toki development takes over, it's just going to be demolished, raised to the ground, and um, just rebuilt um, standardized residential housing. And what is, and being there and talking to people, you of course do think that this has to be first of all studied by a transnational, um, an interdisciplinary group of people excavated and like um, discussed and then maybe if there is an urban um, regeneration project necessary 
that needs to be also um, with dialogue in the people who are living there as well as um, as well as like um, other experts from outside of Turkey where where there has like Armenian people or heritage is there of families who actually previously lived there. So there has to be a, a different kind of dialogue to be able to um, maybe regenerate if necessary um, that neighborhood. So yeah, if considering the wealth of stuff and the trauma and the violence that is, has been happened and is ongoing, the, the, the biggest necessity, I would say, and, and, and there's a huge potentiality of it that um, transnational, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and interdisciplinary teams to work in um, all of the South Caucasus, including Arts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also find that it's really important that the group is going to work. I mean, again, I would refer to history as a discipline, but I'm seeing more and more, you know, edited volumes coming out. So it's not already one scholar who is working and writing a uh, book specifically on one topic but it's mostly edited volumes. So each and every person is contributing, be it about a century, be it about an empire specific aspect. So like I see how many, at least in the Ottoman studies, like different scholars with different backgrounds, Greeks, Armenians, Kurdish, they all are coming up together and writing, let's say second half of the 19th century. So I guess similar things should be also like in architecture. So we'll have the overall picture and we will not divide this in one side and like, you know, have only one side of the story. And maybe, yeah, please, please. No, I was, I was just saying yes. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And maybe coming to my last question, this is a bit heavy one, but I guess we also need to address this to have sort of an idea of what we can do different than what has been done until now. So your research is drawing attention on border spaces which are a contested architecture of at least four modern nation states, as we already mentioned them. So do you see a possibility to solve the ongoing claims of each of these states with the research or with the cooperation via architecture? Yeah, that's a great question. Thing. Um, anything to do? Uh, maybe. So what I see the possibility is boldly is like calling for justice and um, calling for reparations through through a work in architecture and through work of, of history in South Caucasus. Um, so there is ongoing, um, huge ongoing issues with four of these different border spaces that I have chosen to study for my dissertation in regards to their built environment, but um, they are different from one another. But uh, right now this is becoming, so this question is becoming a very central, a very important question being raised by, um, I think it's becoming more and more relevant for architecture to ask. And I can give an example about architecture and, and justice and reparations that, um, for example, Esther Akchen is writing right now a new book that's titled Right to Heal, where um, she is thinking about how architecture is implicated in the state violence, but also how architecture can be a means to provide reparations, bring heal, um, start at least the process of healing. More specific to South Caucasus, um, let me give one historical and then contemporary example. And the contemporary example is um, Lori Kachodurian and Adam Smith are right now um, are working on this project called Caucasus Heritage Watch, where they are um, observing important sites of heritage uh, that mainly predominantly belongs to the Armenians, who are, uh, which are right now situated in the territories uh, under the Azerbaijani state administration. And in this, such a work, the heritage becomes a site of forensics to need evidence for the state violence. And then architecture actually becomes the evidence to be able to call for justice and call for um, and to call out that these um, violence and, and level of ethnic and cultural cleansing happening in the region. Um, and, and then a historical example I have is like maybe a tiny bit different, but I, I do think that it's still very um, relevant for us today to think about the region and what can we do and how can we work on the region together. 
is that in, at the end of 19th century, Nikolai Mar has um, led in extensive excavations at the site of Ani. And what is, of course, these are primarily um, excavations, but what was prominent about these excavations is that these were being done by a configuration of different teams over a long period of time where people from different ethnicities, re religions, and disciplines came together to work. And it's what it produced at the end is not only excavated areas and some, some of the buildings that were under rubble in, in Ani, but also photographic work, painting, um, works of linguistics, and political ideological works and pamphlets that were written in the period. So. Uh, I th think that in the Caucasus, there is this, this potentiality uh, and the necessity of these kind of teams working together and producing work, um, both for calling for justice and reparations and maybe expediting those, and, but also producing creative, um, critical work in the South. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful example. It just reminded me about the memoirs of Mar that I was reading, not only about the excavations, but his like, you know, everyday life when he was having and like, you know, what he was going through and like what other people were going through. So thank you. It's really nice. And I would really recommend that to anybody who is interested in the excavations or like, you know, daily life, how they came back and how they were excavating. But I guess we will finish on this question and I would like to thank you very, very much for, for your research, first of all, and secondly, for accepting our invitation and being with us. And I also want to thank to our listeners and we will see you in our next series. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for these wonderful questions. It also made me think about uh, my work and dissertation also the South Caucasus more deeply. Thank you. Thank you very much and goodbye.